Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Tuesday, April 28th, we're studying Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. St. Paul makes the turn. All men stand condemned under God's law. They have no righteousness of their own to offer him. But there's that small yet important word, but God freely gives his righteousness to sinners through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Harrison Goodman. Pastor Goodman serves at Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas. Pastor Goodman, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Thanks so much for having me. As we get started this morning, Pastor Goodman, give us, give us some context. Paul is turning that corner with today's text. What has he laid out for us in the previous verses that we need to know going into today? Uh, sin breaks stuff. Uh, that would be the long and short of it. Um, so we, we just got done uh, with, with an explanation of what the law shows us. Uh, the law shows us our sin. It is a fantastic diagnosis tool, uh, but it's really, really bad at fixing anything. Um, so uh, because when we hold ourselves up to the law and we find out that well, by the law, none of us are righteous. If there is going to be righteousness, it's going to have to come from somewhere else that's not me, somewhere outside of me. And so this but is where we start to uh, to see what that is going to be. Hint, it's Jesus. That's right. That's right. Sin breaks stuff. Law can't fix it. God's going to do it. Jesus is going to do it. That's a, that's a good, good, however many words that was, summary of Romans <laughs> up to this point. So let's go ahead and jump right in. This is, I think, going to be a familiar text for many. I, I associate this text with Reformation Day. It's it's the epistle reading that's usually appointed for Reformation Day, and we're going to see some of those major themes, uh, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, all, all come into play in this text. So again, Romans 3, verses 21 through 31. Paul writes, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. That's the text for today. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. So Pastor, Pastor Goodman, Paul, Paul comes back to this term that he's laid out already in his thesis statement back in chapter 1, this matter of the righteousness of God, and he brings it, brings it here again, the righteousness of God. Help us into that term as Paul uses it again here in chapter 3. Um, so, so this is a, a justification term, righteousness. That this is, um, are you in accord with God's law? Are are you right? Um, are you uh, in a place where you would stand uh, guilty, or are you in a place where you would stand innocent? And so, when we we hold ourselves up to to the works of the law, we just got done uh, last time in in chapter uh, the beginning of chapter three. Uh, well, my throat is an open grave. So when I hold myself up, for example, to the eighth commandment, you shall not bear false testimony against your neighbor. And, and also the second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Well, how I speak about both my, my neighbor and, and my God, uh, I, I stand condemned there. 
there. Uh, for I, I have been guilty of, of both of these things. For, for righteousness, though, to endure, uh, I, I would have to, to fulfill that. And so uh, when we talk about this word righteousness, it's, it's a word that we actually, um, even though it's a fancy theological term, we see inside of our society uh, frequently, even apart from um, all religion, uh, there, there is a, a righteousness that that pervades social media. There, there is a righteousness that pervades how we talk about politics, how we talk about parenting, how we talk about literally everything, how we talk about fitness, how we talk about food. Um, we, we can recognize so much um, inside of this word that, that even apart from religion, it, it becomes an overwhelming thing. Um, one of the things that, that you see more and more um, in almost a rebellion against this uh, this civil righteousness that, that we're called to uphold is, you know, even just the, the parenting memes about the messy house and the, the mom who's given up on homeschooling in the middle of this, uh, this pandemic. Um, so many ways that, that we would try and hold ourselves up uh, to, to a certain standard. We, we recognize that's what the standard is. To, to be righteous is to meet the standard. Uh, to, to be unrighteous is to, to fall short of it. The problem is that I, I fall short of it. So the, the problem is you fall short of it. The, the righteousness of God is something that we fall short of as well. Paul says that that righteousness is going to be manifested, but it's going to be manifested apart from the law. What does that mean, Pastor Goodman? Well, that, that means then the law paints a picture of what is good. Um, the law paints a picture of how things are supposed to be. Uh, the, the problem is that the law isn't going to be perfectly demonstrated in me. And so if, if the law is the only demonstration of that which is good, that's sort of like saying my stick figure sketch of a dog is the perfect demonstration of what a dog is. Uh, I know that there is a better picture of a dog out there somewhere, but this is the best that I can somehow come up with. And so when you leave it to fallen humanity, cursed by Adam's sin, uh, to, to demonstrate the law, to, to manifest righteousness, to, to, make manifest, uh, to manifest, to make it present, well, we're just not going to be able to come up with it. And so when I hold up a picture of a real dog and I hold up my stick figure dog, there's, there's a huge gap between what it is supposed to be and how it actually is. And so there is such a thing as a perfection. There is such a thing as a, as a righteousness. But the law is not going to be perfectly demonstrated in me. The law is going to be perfectly demonstrated in Jesus who fulfills the law for us. And so if I want to see what it is then perfectly to uphold, for example, the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother, I should look to how Jesus behaves towards his heavenly father, towards Mary, and even towards his, his stepfather, Joseph. Uh, I should not look towards how I've behaved towards my parents because I'm a sinner. And, and so I can't manifest righteousness through the law. I have to start to look to, to Jesus because the law actually paints a picture of well, who God is. It, it, it shows us the kind of God that he is. And you see it even just when you start to think about the Ten Commandments, um, the, the laws that he makes, they're a reflection of his character. Um, in, in the same way that the laws that I, I make in my household, they're a reflection of, of my character. Um, and, and so, for example, in, in my house, there's an 11th commandment, which is thou shalt not touch the stove because I have little children and I want to keep them safe. I give this law because things are better. Things are good. Things are righteous when nobody's hurt. God gives us a first commandment, you shall have no other gods, and in it he reveals to us, well, he actually wants to be our God. But when I want to see this made present, I look to the scriptures and I find my Lord Jesus Christ, who has actually fulfilled what it is to cast aside idolatry and fulfill the law. Uh, this standard of morality um, is one of those things that, that Christians are, are constantly raked over the coals about. Um, if you're really a Christian, why are you such a sinner? And it, it's to anybody who's read Romans, uh, painfully obvious. Well, I I'm a Christian because I need Jesus because I'm a sinner, because I can't fulfill the law, because if there's going to be such a thing as righteousness, it can't come from me. The law will bear witness to it. It will point to the fact that there is such a thing as righteousness. Uh, the, the prophets of old who have promised on who the one who would come to fulfill the law for us, they, they point to Jesus. But, well, Simply put, um, if righteousness is going to be made present among us, show up in our world, I mean, just look around. This obviously isn't going to depend on you or me. This has to depend on something bigger, because the law is something bigger than us. Hmm. So the righteousness of God manifested apart from the law, then. God's righteousness is not going to be seen in my keeping of the law or in your keeping of the law. But it, I, if I'm following you here, Pastor Goodman, but it will be seen in Christ's keeping of the law. That's and and that's where Paul 
Paul starts to go when he starts talking about the law and the prophets bear witness to this righteousness of God that is seen in verse 22 in Jesus Christ. Is that where, where this is headed? Absolutely. I mean, the whole Bible is, is pointing to Jesus. So these things were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus himself says, you know, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And I tell you the truth, these things testify of me. Uh, when, when our Lord would come into the world, it, it is to fulfill the law for us. Um, that, that means, though, uh, there, there's a great hope, even in this first verse, even as uh, the, the hint uh, of where the, the witness is pointing is, is revealed to us. Uh, quite simply, uh, if righteousness is going to be made present among us, apart from the law, apart from the things that you do or I do, well, that means then that reconciliation uh, can't be based on our works. If there is such a thing as, as righteousness in this world, it's not going to be based on me being a good enough parent or a good enough citizen or, or a good enough pastor or a good enough son or, or any of the other vocations that I've been giving. Uh, for, for righteousness to be actually made present among us, manifested among us. This is an incarnate word, manifestation. Uh, there, there's actually a present, true righteousness here for you and for me, but apart from the law. Well, that means then, there has to be something that comes along to take away my unrighteousness. There has to be something to come along and fulfill righteousness in my stead. There has to be a, a free forgiveness of sins. And and that's only going to come in Christ. And and all of this, I think it, it points to just how, how much failure there is in our own attempts to keep righteousness. And you you mentioned earlier, Pastor Goodman, the various ways that we see righteousness in our world today, even apart from what you might typically call religious. But but what we see here is that the righteousness of all of that must fail because the righteousness of God is only going to come not in our keeping of the law, but in someone else's keeping of that law, Jesus Christ. And when we try to keep that law as, as hard as we try, well, it, it always ends in in failure, and I think you see that in spades in our world today in those various ways that we try to be righteous, but we, we just never measure up. Right, and it's, it's a painful, um, well, flat ungodliness, because the law points to Jesus. The law is a, re a, a, a reflection of Jesus. To see the law perfectly fulfilled is to see a painting of our Lord. Uh, but when we grab hold of the law and we try and rip it out of Jesus' hands and we try and use it to create our own righteousness rather than uh, look to all the ways that we must receive Christ through the gospel, um, you see all of these quests for world righteousness in, in work and politic. Um, but the problem is that this is this is chiefly ungodly for two reasons in both the tables of the law in fact uh first and foremost that we we use these things chiefly for self-gain and so running from the righteousness offered in christ our lord we would try to earn it ourselves, fleeing from god but we would also then well seek to use these things well for ourselves again and not for the good of our neighbor thus breaking the second table of the law that that every time we actually try to um use the law apart from the, the gift of righteousness in Christ Jesus, we end up destroying the whole thing by both polluting the first and second tables to love God and love your neighbor. Uh, great irony uh, comes when we, we flee from righteousness offered freely in Christ rather than embrace the fact that he makes us righteous. He has fulfilled the law in our stead so that uh, the good works done through us by God would be a reflection of his righteousness all along instead of us clawing and scraping to try and find a little bit of our own. Before we leave that that very first verse, I want to talk a little bit about that that phrase. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, now, now in the previous section in verses nine through twenty, Paul strings together a lot of references to the Psalms. One reference from Isaiah, making the point that all are unrighteous. So the Old Testament very clearly bears witness to the fact that that people are unrighteous. How now, Paul says the law, the prophets, the Old Testament, bears witness to this righteousness of God that comes from apart from the law. How does the Old Testament give that witness, Pastor Goodman? Well, gosh, I guess that would have to be about Jesus, too. Um, <laughs> if, if there's this common misunderstanding that, that the entirety of the Old Testament is just sort of an angry God the Father um, giving us rules, and the entire New Testament is a really nice God the Son who's telling us to disregard them promptly and then just sort of behave, but 
not in the law way, just in a be kind and don't be offensive kind of way. Uh, but rather, if even in the Old Testament, the Psalms are uh, a manifestation of Christ. For example, we just got through Holy Week where our Lord and Savior from the cross where he redeemed you and me prayed the 22nd Psalm. Uh, we, we have from the prophet Isaiah promises of an incarnation of a, a child born of a virgin. Um, so when we talk then about uh, righteousness uh, manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it, um, both in this section in Romans where we're uh, in the, the earlier verses, verses uh, 9 to 18, Paul is quoting the Old Testament. He's not only showing um, that, well, when we try to fulfill the law, it goes poorly. But there is still, even inside of the Old Testament, a promise of a coming Savior, uh, the one who would actually fulfill the law for us, that, that there is any good news at all in the Old Testament for these passages to be true, but to still hear God wanting to keep Israel, uh, God making promises uh, of, of a resurrection, uh, make God making promises to never forsake. Well, that has to be then righteousness, but just not Israel's by their works, Israel's by the grace given to them in the righteousness received through faith. Mm. And that that's the the but now, right? That mm -hmm. this has now been revealed. What what the Old Testament bore witness to is now here. And that's what, what Paul gets to then in verse 22. He repeats this term, the righteousness of God, that same one that wasn't manifested in the law. He said, it's now here through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Take us into that that term faith. But I mean, there's oh goodness, Pastor Pastor right. Goodman, there's gonna be tons of of words here that are these like Christian words, faith, belief, <laughs> righteousness. We we need to unpack faith and belief for us here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, and, and this this word faith, it's one of those words that uh, is a really frustrating thing because Christians learn to kind of parrot it without ever necessarily learning the meaning. Um, we know that it's important to have faith. And so we say we talk about our faith and we talk about our faith to other uh, faith groups. And we understand that they're using the word too. And we don't understand how we can all say the same words and mean such different things by them. Um, and it leaves us with, with kind of a mess where we don't understand why there's such things as, well, denominations or, or anything like that. But a lot of times it's because when we grab a word like faith, we would try and shoehorn into it different definitions than the ones that are necessarily revealed to us by scripture. And so you have some people then uh, who would, would define the word faith uh, by an active obedience to the law. Um, you would have those who, who would define faith by a, a simple head knowledge um, a, a, of biblical truths or doctrines or Bible trivia. But the problem is that neither of those things can be, for example, even the demons know the name of Jesus. It's just that they don't have faith. And and quite frankly, if, if the, well, the, the word faith is to be measured by how well you're behaving, uh, that means that when you really need Jesus the most and go looking for him, he's the farthest from you. But to, to word, use the word faith in a simple form, I would just grab trust. Um, there, there is an intellectual knowledge that, that goes along with it because you know who you trust in, but that that grows in certain parts of your life and, and sometimes, honestly, even fades in others. So we come into this world and, and we're born and even um, the, the infant recognizes the voice of, of their parents. Uh, um, my, my son would stop crying when I or my wife sang to him because he, he knew our voice, even if he didn't have a, a great intellectual knowledge about who we were, there, there was a trust there. And as he grows in body and stature and, and mind, he's learning more about me. And in the same way, as we grow in our faith, we learn more about our Jesus. And and, and sometimes, uh, sadly, in this world of sin, uh, you see people who, who lose some of that knowledge through curses like dementia or, or Alzheimer's. But what's wonderful, though, is, is that um, faith as trust is something that can exist uh, even apart from necessarily strict knowledge, but but is as the voice of the Savior for the sheep know the voice of their shepherd. And and Christians do know the voice of of their Lord. I know so many pastors who have stories of of praying Lord's prayers with people who have suffered from Alzheimer's and have lost memories of, of so many important things, even sadly family, but still cling to this prayer in, in hope. I know that um our Lord has promised never to forsake us and the Holy Spirit, apart from any uh, reason or strength that we have, would, would instill in us this, this uh, hope, this trust that, that endures uh, wonderfully, even in the midst of, of 
well, having an old Adam that, that appears to be a really good swimmer. So, uh, well, even in my daily life, uh, when I, I would try and measure my faith by my works or by my knowledge and then come up short on both, our Lord would continually, daily and richly forgive my sins and the sins of all believers and continue to promise to me on the last day he will raise me and all the dead uh, and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ and then give me the, the, the faith, the, the trust that would let me actually say, this is most certainly true, even while I look around and I see nothing of the sort. Uh, faith is a, a short word, just call it trust, and it cuts through a lot of the garbage. <laughs> Mm, right. Yeah. Trust is a, a very helpful term to think about when we're thinking of faith. And I, I think the word trust helps us to focus more on the object than the trust itself, because trust is only as good as whatever it is that I happen to be trusting. So the chair that I'm sitting in right now is I'm placing a bit of trust in that chair that it's not going to break. And thus far, the chair, I'm happy to report, is you know, it's, it's loyal. It's, 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 it's trustworthy. And, and that, that word trust, faith, maybe sometimes we can focus on the faith rather than the object. Trust points us toward the object, which is certainly what Paul would have us be looking at right here, because he's already said the righteousness of God is manifested apart from the law. It's not going to be your works, your doing, but it's, it's something else. It's faith and, and trust, faith in, in what or in whom, Jesus Christ. If you want to see the righteousness of God, quit looking at the law, your works according to it, look instead at Jesus. Absolutely. But this is what old Adam would always do is he would try and take the things of God and set them against God himself. Faith in Jesus is not set against Jesus. The hope in the object is not set against the object itself. Rather, faith in Jesus goes to Jesus. Um, our, our confessions are, are just, our Lutheran confessions are loaded uh, with, with uh, Romans chapter three, for obvious reasons, uh, with justification being our, our chief article. Uh, but I, I, there's this quote in the solid declaration of the formula of Concord. That's a wonderful thing that describes my faith. And, and it would say, faith justifies not because it is so beautiful a virtue. It justifies because it lays hold of and accepts Christ's merit in the promise of the Holy Gospel. So faith is only wonderful insofar as, well, the thing that we have trust in actually works. Uh, like like your chair, it's, it's holding on. And so our faith then isn't in our faith. Our faith is in the uh, risen Lord. Hmm. That, that's right. So, so what do we see? I mean, Paul, Paul says the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. What is it that we see in Jesus Christ that is this righteousness of God for us? We see the death and resurrection. Uh, we see the, the passion of our Lord. We see justification, uh, again, made manifest, made present, so that when our Lord would come into this world, he wouldn't just sort of simply to uh, show up to remind us to behave. Uh, he would fulfill the law in our stead. So we would see both his his active righteousness, where he um, he fulfills the law completely. He obeys the Ten Commandments. He keeps the law in a way that uh, we are not able to, not only treasuring it, but actually doing it. Uh, but also, he, he is uh, righteous in a passive sense, where he is nailed to the cross for my sins, that he who knew no sin became sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that because our Lord was subject to the wrath of God in our stead upon the cross, well, through his death and resurrection, I am purchased and won from all sins, from death and the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy and precious blood, with his innocent suffering and death that I would be his own and live under him in his kingdom. And here is something then that, that faith can actually latch onto. Christ is risen from the dead, that he who is nailed to the cross and, and stopped breathing died because, well, the wages of sin is death, gives us his own free gift that, that is life everlasting. And then Paul, he, he, he starts to, I mean, he's pulling a lot of things together that he's, he's been building to this point. One of the things that, that you see him do in the first three chapters of Romans up to this point is to erase the distinction between Jew and Gentile. He says, all of you, Jew or Gentile, you're all accountable to God before the law. There's no excuse for any of you. you Gentiles, you, you had the law written on your hearts. You showed it by what you did, and so you're accountable to the law. Jews, you knew it. God gave it to you from Sinai. You're definitely accountable. All of you, there's, there's no distinction in the condemnation. All share in this unrighteousness of Adam that they've inherited and then seen very clearly in what they do and think and say. But, but the good news is that that distinction that's gone is also gone in this matter of justification. 
Absolutely. Um, this this actually makes uh, Christianity a great equalizer. And in a world that is right now so caught up on, on equality and trying to measure it in all of the wrong ways, uh, our, our Lord offers us a great hope. Um, for, for most certainly all stand condemned by the law, but sinners are really bad at actually seeing it this way. And so I'm 100% I'm sure that I fell just a little bit less short of glory than other people. And here again, I try and uh, I try and manifest my own righteousness through the law rather than apart from the law, I find it revealed uh, through Christ Jesus who was manifested among us as God incarnate. Uh, in other words, I keep trying to be good my way into heaven, and or at least be better than you my way into heaven. Uh, but our Lord, who not only sees us all condemned by the law, makes us all equal in light of the gospel. Because at the end of the day, if all of your sins are forgiven and all of my sins are forgiven, there's no more disparity anymore, even among the way that, that you and I would measure it. Uh, it's, a, it's a great gift to, to sit in the pews um, or, or even these days over the live stream on my couch uh, and hear uh, the, the great promise of the gospel that all of the sins of the world were carried by Jesus. And that means that not only my sins that, that leave me in, in guilt, but even my neighbor's sins, the, the ones committed against me that leave me in shame, uh, were forgiven by Jesus. We stand as equals, as brothers and sisters in Christ, holy, completely righteous in his sight, holy then completely righteous in each other's sight. Because we who trust that our Lord forgives sins can actually hear that he also forgives the sins of the others. Now, this uh, lets us actually start to look at each other, not um, sort of trying to dissolve uh, gender or vocation or any other ways that our, our world would try and manifest uh, an equality by saying there's no uh, distinction between male or female, uh, not in terms of uh, godly righteousness, but just in, in terms of uh, practicality, which the world just doesn't work that way. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, instead, I can say, I know that women are holy in light of the Lord, for they were died for by Christ. And I know that men were died for by Christ and so also stand in the same holiness. And so even though there, there is a, a, a difference between men and women biologically, there is not an inequality. Uh, rather, I, I can find that, that God's creation, uh, that which has fallen by the first Adam, is redeemed by the second. Uh, we, we can actually then find uh, justification as, as a great, great trumpet of, of um, righteousness, not just for me, but for those who my old Adam would rather look down upon. And this is that thing that lives inside of all of our hearts that we wrestle with so much, it is the, the desire to find at least some kind of group or people or class that, that we can cast aside and, and use to crawl on top of, to stand up and say, we are more righteous than you. Rather, we can hear uh, Christ say, no, you're not, you're holy. And you don't have to improve upon that. In fact, you can't improve upon that, so stop trying. Uh, and, and those who, who feel downtrodden and downcast can, can look up and say, there is nothing to stand above me, for Christ himself has lifted me up to the, to the, to the side of Christ, even as he sits at the right hand of the Father. He himself, who is, has ascended uh, past death itself, has promised me that kind of holiness, so much so that he would call us all saints, that is, holy ones. Uh, there, there's no distinction there. Um, all who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God are justified by grace as a gift through Jesus Christ. So we measure Jesus again, not ourselves. You're listening to Sharp Iron here on Worldwide KFUO. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be right back. Please stick around. In many ways, St. Matthew Lutheran Church in Bel Air, Maryland is just like any other Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod Church. They have worship services each Sunday and reach out to their community, but one thing they don't do is pay their electric bill. Hello, this is Rahema Kavuga, Synod Relations Manager of Lutheran Church Extension Fund. And if you want to hear what St. Matthew actually did to eliminate their electric bill, just visit interesttime.org. That's interesttime.org. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. On this Tuesday, April 28th, we're looking at Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31, with Pastor Harrison Goodman of Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas. Pastor Goodman, prior to the break, we were talking about that there is no distinction when it comes to this gift that Christ freely gives. His active obedience, his passive obedience was done for all sinners, period, all of us who are unrighteous. 
and and Paul talks about this with a word that again is one of those terms that sometimes we just throw around and, and use as Christians, but we need to make sure we know what it is. That word is is justification. He says in verse twenty four that they all are justified by His grace as a gift. What is this justification? What does that mean? Right. So inside of justification, we find the word justice, that, that justice has been given. And, and so if, if this justice is given uh, by, by grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, apart from our works of the law, that means that we can say that we are declared right with God, righteous with God that we are declared holy and innocent before God apart from anything that we could do. That, that means justification is the death and resurrection of Jesus that covers all of our sins and not your works. And so the Augsburg Confession would talk about justification in this light, that men cannot be justified before God by their own strengths or merits or works, but are freely justified for Christ's sake through faith when they believe that they are received into favor and that their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake who by his death made satisfaction for our sins. Uh, in other words, justification, it's a really fancy word. And if you use it uh, in a theological argument, you'll sound smarter than you probably are. And that's why I use it a lot. Uh, but if you want to actually simplify it, look at a crucifix. Justification is an image word. If I want to see what justification looks like, I, I don't look like me. I, I look up to the crucifix and I see my Lord die for me because through his death, I made holy. Through his death, my sins are taken away. And, and this this is huge. Uh, this, is, this is as big as it gets. With, without this, there can never be any certainty. There can never actually be any right trust. Uh, this word faith gets really, really shaky. And, and this is where you start to see the word faith uh, latched onto instead of the object uh, that our faith is in. Because, well, if justification is not holy and completely in Jesus, apart from any works or strength or merits that I could ever bring to the table, if it depends even a little bit on me, well, then I can mess it up. And so I can't, I have to take my eye off of Jesus then and start worrying about my own stuff. Uh, without Jesus fulfilling the whole law for me, without Jesus totally and completely making me righteous, holy, uh, saved, uh, I, I always have to stop looking at the thing I trust in and, and start looking at myself. And so we can't give an inch on justification. Uh, this is the article that, that uh, our confessions would say, this is on uh, the article on which the church stands or falls. This is the chief article. Um, here we, we have a, a great hope that I can't mess this up. I can actually be certain about my salvation, so certain that I'll call myself a saint right now, not because I behave my way into heaven or because I can predict the future, but because I trust my Lord's promise given to me in the waters of baptism that he has made me righteous and he is not going to quit on me. And this, this is the chief article because apart from it, there, as you said, there is no certainty. Apart, apart from this, it it somehow depends upon us, and all of these, you know, I mean, uh, we've we've looked at a few words sort of by themselves, but all of these words have to go together, justified, well, by his grace as a gift. I mean, that means it doesn't depend on me at all? Not not even not even one little bit, Pastor Good, I can't even take just a, a tiny hair of credit? The second you try to, you're going to ruin the whole thing. Uh, that's the problem. Um, the second you try and lay hold of even the tiniest little part of this thing, well, that means there's just the tiniest little part of this thing that, that you can still carry. That, that means that you have to add at least the tiniest little part to Christ who said it's finished and not it's mostly and almost completely finished, but for the tiniest little bit that I expect from you. Uh, the second we add even just a tiny little bit of ourselves, that the tiniest little bit, uh, everything starts to sink into ruin because, well, the law will show us our sin. And so the second, even the tiniest little bit of the law is given to old Adam. First, he's going to try and make an idol out of himself and use it to justify himself. But, but second, he's also going to turn it into a weapon and try and use it against his neighbor. Uh, and again, we, we, we've polluted the entirety of the law, both first and second table, by trying to, to be the one who would earn credit for it. Uh, rather, we, we look wholly and completely to Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And that's enough. Because the thing is, as soon as we, we add even the tiniest little bit, you do have faith in your faith instead of, well, faith in your Lord. Uh, the second you add even the tiniest little bit, uh, you, you do have to, to carry this uh, in some fashion on your own. And there's a lot of people that think they're doing a great job. Uh, but that's, well, I mean, there's a lot of people that think, uh, well, Ponzi schemes are great investments until they finally go and try and cash in and they realize that they put their faith in something that's just not holding water. Uh, faith is a word that, uh, 
well, it has meaning outside of Christianity uh, because it's just trust. Everybody has faith in something. Everybody trusts in something. The question, though, is can this thing withstand death? And, well, there's only one thing that's conquered death, and that's Jesus Christ our Lord. Right. Yeah. The, he's justified. So again, just to keep us going through these, justified by his grace as a gift through the, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, there's his, his conquering of death, this matter of, of buying us back. You quoted, you quoted earlier, Pastor Goodman, from, from Luther's explanation to the second article of the, of the creed, which is just some of the best writing in all of, of Christendom, in my opinion, that, the mm -hmm. I mean, the, how he has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and and won me from all sin, from death and the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, his innocent suffering and death. I mean, it, it, everything there focuses our attention on what what Christ has done. And the the images, there's such a, a wonder of of image here. You know, sometimes we we sort of we just plow through this language without pausing to consider the various imagery that's there. But justification has that that courtroom imagery, that declaration of innocence. Redemption has this image of, of being bought, of being purchased and, and won away from some kind of slavery into freedom. And then into to verse 25, there's that word propitiation, which that's one we probably need to spend a little bit of time on because it's such a foreign, I don't know if that, does that one get used anywhere else, Pastor Goodman? Oh, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. It's, I, I think it might be one or two other places, but I couldn't tell you. Um, I, I know it's a very important word, uh, though. Um, propitiation, it, it's, it's an appeasement. Um, it, it's a word uh, that, yes, it is used uh, in, in Hebrews and, and 1 John. Um, it, it's, it's a making, well, a regaining of favor. Um, it, it's a taking that which is wronged and making it right. Um, and... and well, that can only happen one way. For sin can only ever be covered in blood. Uh, if, if sin breaks stuff, its cost is always blood. We we mistake this constantly because we try and buy and sell with the word "I'm sorry." Uh, we we try and, and and you know forgive but but not forget, which means uh, I, I've got points that I will bring back up to you. And so if you tell me, you know, I, I I messed up, I'm sorry, I've sinned against you, and I say, don't worry about it, I usually mean I'll worry about it for you, and I'll, I'll forgive but not forget, which means that at the right time, I will I will bring this back forward. Um, but if God is put forward as a propitiation by blood, his own son, Jesus Christ, his sacrifice upon the cross, that means that appeasement has already happened. That that means that the sin was covered, and, and this has always been the case from the, the sacrifice is in Old Testament Israel, uh, where where the sins were, were covered by the, the shedding of the blood of an animal, which would point at to the ultimate shedding of blood of Jesus, uh, where Hebrews would grab hold of the term. But but also e even just all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where after Adam and Eve sin and, and hide in the bushes, God would shed blood by uh, covering them with animal skin, sacrificing an animal, covering their sins with blood, uh, so that uh, they can they can be appeased to look at each other again. Uh, th this is a very important word, and it sounds, again, really, really fancy. But uh, again, it, it's, it's an image word uh, where we can look to a, at least the way Romans describes it, simply the crucifix. I know what God's righteousness looks like. I know what propitiation looks like. It looks like a dead Jesus hanging on a tree for you and for me and for all of the world. And we receive this gift of, of Christ's sacrifice by faith. Uh, because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. And again, you see this, this image of Passover where, again, the, the blood covers the sinners, that, that the angel of death passed over the homes of, of the Israelites who had covered their, their lintels in the blood of the lamb sacrificed so that, uh, that these people would then not be judged simply by their merits, not by their works, but only is their blood there, has it paid for then they're God is appeased and the angel of death passes over. We too are covered in this blood of the lamb, but not simply the, the, the blood of four-legged beasts, but the blood of the living God who has conquered death in our stead. I think with that word appeasement, I, th I think it's important to point out that God puts Jesus forward as this propitiation, that this is the will of God in action. In other words, it's, it's not God's, God's wrath must be satisfied. But it's it's not like uh, what's I don't want to get the wrong picture of it as if somehow God the Father is only angry at us and in steps Jesus who only loves us in in some way shape or no God the Father is the one who gave Jesus in the first place this is 
and and all of this, all of this together, this multifaceted picture or, or image is is God's righteousness together. And I like the way you keep bringing us back, Pastor Goodman. If you want to see all of this, look look at Christ on the cross. There's God's righteousness, His wrath being poured out on on someone because it it had to be poured out on someone, but it wasn't poured out on you and me. It was poured out on Jesus, who who took our sin, made it his own, received that. There's God's righteousness, his his wrath being satisfied. And yet at that same moment, it's his righteousness being given as as a gift freely, apart from anything that, that you or I did. There's Jesus on the cross for me, for you. I, I didn't do anything for that. It's all a gift. And, and all of it comes together there in Christ crucified for you and for me. Absolutely. And there we, we can finally make uh, heads or tails of a God who would be wrathful um, and loving at the same time, because it's it's easy to have one or the other, which is why we sort of try and oscillate between the two, because I'm sure that, sure that God is mad at all the people I'm mad at, and I'm sure that God loves me without me ever having to worry about anything, uh, such as, as right and wrong, such as holiness or unholiness. But when I look to the cross, I can recognize two things. First, um, my neighbor, well, that's that's God's child too. Um, and, and God's allowed to be mad when I hurt his kids. Uh, in fact, if you want to see me stop being a pastor and start being a dad real, real quick, you, you hurt my kids. Um, I'm going to be angry. I, I'm going to be wrathful. But in the same way, uh, God loves us so much that that um, he, he exercises this wrath simply against himself, that this isn't, you know, angry God the Father against nice God the Son, but but this is the whole triune God um, active inside of the economy of the Trinity to redeem, uh, justify, and sanctify the sinner. Uh, and so I can see then um, the, the Father who sends the Son, I can see the Son willingly bearing the cross for you and for me. I can see the Holy Spirit pouring out this, this faith which would go to Jesus and then delivering this Jesus to me under word and sacrament so that in all of it, I can see the, these words justification um, uh, propitiation, uh, righteousness, uh, being given a as a gift that would actually look like not me doing something, but Jesus doing something for me. And and there, I mean, that takes us, I think, into verse 26, where, where Paul, again, he's here, I was to show his righteousness at the present time. This, this now has been seen in Jesus so that, so that he might be just and righteous the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. There's a lot of, of righteousness talk, justification talk. It's, it's the same root in Greek, all being mm -hmm. smashed together here. What, what's Paul driving at? This is not about you. This is about Jesus for you. Uh, the long and short of it is that, that if you want to see how things are supposed to be, look to him who not only fulfilled the law, but saves you who didn't. Look to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So... Then Paul gets very exclusive, and this this is going to take us back to some of the conversations that we've been having already when it comes to misunderstandings in terms of what faith is, misunderstandings when it comes to that chief article concerning the justification of the sinner, as we've, we've talked about. Paul begins to get very exclusive in the way that he talks here, and he's only going to leave this one option open for us when it comes to our forgiveness, our salvation. He's already knocked everything out of the way in chapters one through three, the first part of the chapter. Now he's he's going to remind us, hey, there's only one way. H how do we see Paul start to use this exclusive language? And, and Pastor Goodman, help us to remember, why is it so important that we follow Paul here? Absolutely. And this, this exclusive language that you're talking about, um, it, it's different from the email spam that we get that, that constantly offers us exclusive offers that aren't actually exclusive. Um, this word exclusive, it means that which excludes. Exclusive language is language that excludes, that counts out something, uh, not offers it to, to everything through any way, but but says this is the only way. Everything else is is, is taken outside of it. And so your justification uh, will not be measured in anything that you can do through the works of the law. And that means then when you look at the life of the Christian, uh, you can say a lot of things are good, 
but that doesn't mean that they save. And so, for example, uh, when I hold the law up to myself and I can say I know what good looks like now because God has revealed to me the fullness of his law and I can see it even demonstrated in Christ our Lord. And so I can even then study my catechism and learn then that, that, that uh, sin manifests itself apart from, you know, crude outward acts, but there is thought and word and deed uh, all together that, that, that um, there, there is not just the sins of the things that I, I did wrong, but even the sins of the things I, I should have done but didn't, um, that the sins of, of commission and omission. Uh, I, I can see then that when I look at all of these things, I failed miserably. And I'm sorry, I, I'm contrite, uh, I, I am heartbroken, I, I am terrified of, of wrath and judgment. This we call contrition. That doesn't save you. It's good to be contrite over sin. It's good to, to not be thrilled that you hurt your neighbor, that you drove yourself farther from God, but it doesn't save you. Uh, Christians are manifestations of, of God's love because, well, we are made holy. So Christians do good works. Christians absolutely do good works after receiving the Holy Spirit uh, in faith, but that doesn't save you either. Uh, both of these, contrition and and um, and, and active uh, doing of the law, uh, the, 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 the living inside of your vocation, uh, recognizing good is good and actually pursuing it, they are a part of Christian life. But in terms of your justification, cast them aside as far as the East is from the West. We hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. That means that when it comes to the simple question, are you okay with Jesus? Are you going to go to heaven and then on the last day rise? We do not look at ourselves one iota. We do not look at, at our faith one iota. We look at the thing our faith is in. We look to Jesus and only Jesus. Everything else is excluded. How sorry you are, whether or not you have turned your life around, all of it is cast aside and we look only at Jesus. And, and that's why the conversation that we were having earlier concerning what faith is, is so important. And, and perhaps sometimes it, it seems to those outside, maybe even those inside, that it's it's nitpicky, that, that, well, close enough, right, Pastor Goodman? But no, in this matter, we have to maintain this exclusive language, or what happens? We start trying to measure ourselves instead of our God. Um, but the problem is, Paul tells us that um, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is in vain. That doesn't happen in me. That happens in Jesus. Uh, and so uh, when, when I want to measure this in me, well, rise from the dead by yourself. Then I'll, I'll see whether or not you've got something worth holding on to. Uh, the, the reason that, that we're so particular about this, um, even arguably nitpicky about this, is the second that we try and add ourselves into this in any capacity. Uh, we rob the resurrection of all of its promise. We, we rob Easter of all of its joy. And we start to say then part of this thing doesn't depend on the empty tomb. Part of this thing depends on me who is rushing toward the tomb. That's not going to help. Right. Yeah. So So again... Stick with Paul. <laughs> we hold that one is justified by faith apart, of the, apart from the works of the law. And, and leave it at that. Like you said, are good works good? Of, of course. But they don't save. And, and we're talking here about salvation. So what place have good works here? We're not talking about good works right now. We're talking about salvation and i mean that sounds that sounds crazy and you can maybe you can see why why some of the critics of of luther and, and other lutheran reformers you guys don't like good works no that's not it we like good works good works are, are good they're they're necessary even but they don't save they can't that's save. that line has to stay there yes yes they don't save they can't save all of that <laughs> and if we if we move that line then then we risk everything absolutely uh again the, the second that that line is moved even a little bit and it's always done so with the best of intentions again to to defend that good works are good and again good works are good uh we, we would love to sort of start to say if you were really a christian you would and the problem is i should i haven't the problem is, if you want to measure your Christianity by yourself, um, you took out Christ and, and, well, you've already ruined the name because then it's just eanity. Um, it, it's, it's idolatry. 
at its purest form, the second you're introduced to this, even, even the slightest little bit, and it's always actually done in the attempt to preserve uh, God's law. Um, again, the, the problem comes when you want to start to, to hold up the law as a, a, an image of yourself. Um, rather, the, the great joy of finding justification completely apart from works of the law is that you can talk about the law more not less. You can actually stand a little bit closer to it if you're not afraid of it condemning you. And so this you see, for example, as Jesus uh, would confront uh, the Pharisees during the Sermon on the Mount, where he talks to them about lust and, and, and hatred um, actually being sins against the, the sixth and fifth commandments, respectively. Um, Jesus can stand a whole lot closer to the law if he's not afraid of it. If you're terrified of the law because you actually expect that at least even a little bit of it has to do with your measurement as a Christian, well, you can't count that or you have to start taking in excuses or um dare we say, justifications uh, uh, that, that aren't Jesus. And so I was, I was, I know it's not ideal to hate this person, but he started it. Or, or I know that it, it's not ideal uh, to, to lust, but, but she dressed that way. And in all of it, you have, you have cast aside Jesus, not only for yourself, but also for your neighbor. You, you've started to try and climb over other people to, to reach heaven. And in all of it, you, you, every bit as helpless as the Tower of Babel, where again, they, they tried the same thing, trying to build upon themselves and their works to reach heaven. And it really only left one person standing on top of another, still short of the goal. Um, rather Rather, we look entirely and completely to Christ apart from works of the law so that when we go back to the law, justified, holy, uh, completely in Christ, we don't have to worry so much. Mm. And, and in that sense, I, I think that then propels us forward into the rest of this text, which I believe on Reformation Sunday, we end at verse 28. We don't get 29 through 31. But, but I think what you've laid out here is precisely where Paul is going, particularly into verse 31, where, where he says, look, are we overthrowing the law by this faith? He says, no way. We actually are upholding the law, that it's it's only when the law is put in that proper place and and not a part of justification and being right before God, only then can we truly hear the law and and begin to to do it. We're not afraid of it anymore because it's not a way that I'm trying to make myself right before God and my neighbor. Now it's it's simply about loving God and actually loving my neighbor instead of using it for my own purposes. Right. And, and there's a great freedom in that. Um, it, it's, it's a freedom to say the law is good even when I am not. It's a freedom uh, to, to, well, be labeled a hypocrite, which is one of the great commandments. And, and don't get me wrong, even in the scriptures, the word hypocrite is never used in a positive, positive connotation. It's bad to be a hypocrite. But at the other side of it, though, to be a hypocrite is simply to believe in something bigger than yourself. Um, if, if you're not a hypocrite, that means that you are a perfect demonstration of what you consider righteous um, to the Christian. Well, I consider the Ten Commandments righteous. I consider my God righteous. And when I look at myself, I say, well, nope, didn't do that. But God was righteous for me. Um, my failing and falling short of the law, so awful that Jesus had to die for it. But I don't need to only try the law if I know for a fact I can perfectly do it. I don't need to then only try and be a father when I'm sure that I would never possibly mess up. I, I have the, the great freedom to live inside of a mess and even be messy myself. Because if I am completely regenerated through faith, if I have received the Holy Spirit and, and righteousness and the waters of my baptism, if I am as holy as God says that I am, when I go out to, to actually try and love my son, it's about him and not me. I can say there is such a thing as perfection and I'm going to pursue it. But if I fall short of it, God died for that. God rose so I don't have to worry. Who cares if I fall short of God's perfection? If I know that my sins are forgiven, I'm going to be a messy father because I'm already righteous in God's sight. And instead of worrying about myself, I'm going to try and serve my family through the doing of the law, which I consider good without the need to perfectly demonstrate it because it's already been perfectly demonstrated in Christ. Um, if then I can say um, it's bad for me to be a hypocrite, I wish that I was a better father. I can also say I know my sins are forgiven. And I'm going to dust myself off and, and actually uphold the law as a recognition of, well, sin breaks stuff. And so things will go better when I, I chase after the Ten Commandments. I, I will be a better husband. I will be a better father. I will be a better pastor. I will be a better citizen when I look to the law as that which is good, even knowing that I'm not a perfect demonstration of it. Who cares? Jesus is a perfect demonstration of it for me. And so I'm going to do my best and know that God will actually bless this, work within this, and accomplish more good through me than I could have ever done myself. After all, we are, are his workmanship created for these good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Um, I, I can just say then, 
just like the hymns that I sing, uh, the angels clean it up between here and heaven. I can say that, that the mediation of Jesus, his blood cleans up my works between here and, and, and God's sight on judgment day and, and not worry about myself at all. I will only worry about my neighbor because God is worried about me for me. With eyes fixed on Christ the whole time, the one who has justified us freely by his blood. Pastor Harrison Goodman is the pastor at Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in San Antonio, Texas, helping us this morning with Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. Pastor Goodman, thanks for your time today. Thanks so much. The righteousness of God is manifested apart from the law. You don't see it in what you do or in what I do. You see it in what Christ has done for you. Look to the cross. There you see God's righteousness, his wrath against our sin poured out, not upon you or me, but upon his son, Jesus Christ. And now given freely, apart from anything I or you can do, would ever do, it's done. It's finished in Christ Jesus. There is our, our salvation. It is a gift for you and for me. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithfield, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.